Excuse me. Uh, Sam is going to do it for you. So, so it's going to open you to be the host. Okay. Maybe uh, just a couple of seconds, maybe to, he would do it. Whenever you are ready, Dr. Bachor. Yeah, okay. Uh, Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh jami'an. Uh, our talk today is about the evolution of stars. Uh, the, the slides are written in Arabic mostly, and I'm going to speak in English. Uh, please, uh, if you want to ask any question, just raise your hand, or we can leave the questions uh, to the end of the talk. Uh, I, first, I would like to thank uh, uh, SAST team for the nice organization for the nice organizing of such uh, seminars uh, during the whole year. So uh, we can earn a lot of knowledge during these talks and to discuss uh, many issues regarding uh, astronomy, space sciences and technology. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the formation of stars uh, at the beginning, uh, the evolution versus masses. Uh, 
are about the evolution of low mass stars, intermediate mass stars, and uh, high mass stars. Um, uh, I will not exactly talk about the stellar remnants because it needs a specific talk, but uh, I will just uh, uh, talk about the end of the evolutionary stage of these um, uh, trajectories to low mass, intermediate mass, and high mass stars, and about uh, if we uh, still have time to talk about stellar populations. Ash to ash, dust to dust, that proverb reminds us that all human beings are given life and all die. With stories in between, stars too have life cycles and like human beings, they do not all have the same life. Uh, Dr. Mashor, are you sharing your screen with us? Am I muted? Uh, no, I am hearing, but I don't see your screen. Okay, no, I do now share. They were cut, I don't know what happened. Uh, is it okay now? Yeah, now we can see it, yeah. Okay. So uh, we just showed the outlines here. And uh, this, this is the proverb which we talked about, stars to have life cycles like human beings. And we talked about the formation of the, of the, the proto or, or the, uh, a very, uh, be, uh, let's say it, the very uh, uh, primitive stars from the uh, original clouds at the beginning of the universe, which happened uh, be after the dark age, um, mostly uh, more than um, millions of years after the Big Bang. So uh, the clouds, still are uh, uh, clouds or gas clouds, which uh, could be, um, resulted from a, an explosion of a huge star like our sun. Our sun contains elements. From where we got the elements in our sun, we got the elements of our sun from the explosion of a mother star, which was huge. That mother star was uh, also a, a daughter for a grandma star. Uh, so our, our sun is the, is the third generation. We know that from the metallicity of the sun, the number or the ratio of the uh, heavy metals. When we talk about heavy metals in stars, we are talking about everything beyond helium, beryllium, carbon, oxygen, all these things. And the ratio in the sun of these elements, no more than 0 0.02, less than 0 0.02, less than 2%, which is very little. Um, 
In spite of that, we call it metal rich star. So 2% means a metal rich star, means a third generation uh, star. How it forms? It forms from, from a cloud of gas. This gas contains these elements, but mostly the hydrogen and helium. So as an example, the, the luminosity of the sun, when it was a, a young star, it was around 14 to 48 eggs per second or 4 to 10 to 41 watts, which comparing with the situation now, uh, 3.8 to the power 26 watts, which is very small comparing with, with, the, with the sun uh, when it was very young star, uh, T-Tauri star, we call uh, that star, uh, that kind is called T-Tauri star. So now when it became uh, a main sequence star, the, the radius contracted, uh, it shrinks down, uh, uh, getting smaller, uh, temperature higher, of course. Um, during the contraction and the evolution of the star, we call it the pre-main sequence stage. It didn't yet reach the the youth, uh, the the main sequence um, uh, stars, which uh, mainly. Uh, has some kind of equilibrium between the radiation from resulted from the nuclear interactions in the core and the contraction due to the gravity. So we have a, a, a equilibrium between both of these two main forces inside the star. This is the main sequence. Before that, we called pre-main sequence star. We have several stars actually when we searching about stars, we got um, several uh, systems uh, which can be classified as pre-main sequence stars. Some of them we call it subgiants. Subgiants usually it's a post-main sequence star, but sometimes if it's still big and contracting, we call it subgiants going down to the main sequence. After the main sequence lifetime, it's gonna go up as a subgiant. So we have two kinds of subgiants. The those who are going down towards the main sequence uh, stars and those which those who are going upward from the main sequence. Uh, the first one not yet reached the main sequence. The second one finished the main sequence stage. So these two main uh, subgiant uh, uh, states, we should be aware when we study stars, which is which, how to distinguish between them. Um, as we said, the, the, the mass of the star uh, is essential parameter for the lifetime of the star, for what's going to happen inside the core of the star, what kind of uh, evolution, uh, what kind of uh, nuclear uh, interactions is going to happen at the core of the star, what evolutionary track uh, the star is going to follow. So uh, the, this period, which is around um, 10 to 30 uh, million years for a star like the mass of the sun uh, until it reaches the main sequence. So it will uh, take around uh, 3, 10 to the power 7, which, which is 30 million years to reach the main sequence. It's just a contraction, contracting, uh, raising the temperature, um, uh, shrinking. Uh, absorbing uh, all gas around from the from the cloud. This is the uh, preliminary uh, stage of the formation of a, any star. So starting from a dense core, very cold, uh, suppose with 200,000 astronomical units, like um, uh, the, the, the distance from here to the sun is one. So 200,000 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun, now contracting down due to the gravitational collapse uh, until it reaches 10,000 astronomical units, the time still zero. Okay, now contracting again until it reaches 500 astronomical units. And this takes between 10,000 to 100,000 years. Again, 
now it reached the T tower stage, which is a pre main sequence uh, star with bipolar ejection from uh, two poles and contract contracting again until it reaches 100 astronomical units. It may form also the uh, planetary uh, debris disk uh, with some uh, planets around it. This takes between 3 million to 50 million years uh, until it reaches the uh, main sequence stage. Uh, it could uh, take more, uh, more than 50 million years. So um, this uh, cloud could be fragment. We call it fragmentation. The fragmentation would, would result in, in, in either two stars, three stars, four stars, or one star with several planets around it. So this is a, a one of the, the fragmentation is one of the most important uh, things what happened usually to the clouds. Uh, it could form binary star, triple system, quadruple system, or it may form also planets around these stars. Here we have a real uh, image from Hubble Space Telescope for a uh, bipolar ejection of a T Tauri star. This star is still forming, not yet reached the main sequence. This image was taken in 1995, this one in 1998, and this one in 2000 for the same star. Of course, it will not finish this stage within three years or four years. It takes millions of years. They will not be able to, to image it in the, the, in, the, in the next stage. We will uh, stay uh, just watching this uh, in our lifetime to, to, to see only one stage, which is uh, the t Tauri uh, bipolar ejection. So we can easily see that bipolar ejection from, from the two poles of the cloud. Uh, finally, it, it will reach the, the the stage like our sun, this star. Uh, when you just have a look to, to the box, to the what's written about the evolution of stars, you will find actually um, uh, no specific limits between masses. As when I, I remember when I was a master student, they talked about five solar masses, uh, the, the limit between uh, a white dwarf uh, for a star to be to, to result into a white dwarf and a neutron star. Now we are going to talk about eight instead of five. That was 25 years ago. So uh, uh, no specific limits. Even I, I read an article um, a week ago, which gives different uh, uh, limits than those which I'm going to talk about. So uh, I will note this again when I, I show it. So uh, we will follow the following uh, classification. I did this myself, depending on several papers, depending on uh, many articles uh, in this field. Uh, I suppose that these uh, limits, mass limits, are the best up to date. But it's not absolute. So uh, now. I will take 0 0.013, 0 0.08 solar masses, 0.5 mass solar masses, 1.5 solar masses, five solar masses, but, but you can see here, I put these all together, these one, two, three together, okay? And after that, I put here eight solar masses. After that, there's 25 solar masses. This, some of the, some of the, uh, of the researchers proposed uh, 16 instead of eight here. Some of them uh, proposed 36 instead of 25 here. So these numbers are not absolute. But when we are talking about the, the, these low uh, mass stars, uh, more or less up to 95%, we can say these limits are right. But here still under research, we don't know yet exactly what's the limit for a star to, to uh, become a black hole uh, instead of being a neutron star. And we will talk about these uh, masses one by one. The, let's start with a planet. 
If the mass of the cloud is small, less than 0 0.013 solar masses, the temperature of the core will not reach any nuclear reaction. So it will stay as a planet, cold, and it would be like the, uh, our Jupiter. So the limit is 0 0.013. No deuterium fusion, it will stay a planet, and forever, nothing will happen, just a planet. So uh, let's take Jupiter as an example. Jupiter mass is 3, 317 Earth masses, which is only, only uh, 0 0.00095 solar masses, almost 1,000 1, of the solar masses. So we need 130 times mass of Jupiter to become uh, a planet, uh, to become a, a, a star, okay? It will stay a planet, even if it's 100 more massive, it will stay a planet, okay? 100 times more will stay a planet. Now, the next one, after that, more than 0 0.013, it will become a star, one kind of stars. These stars, we call it uh, brown dwarfs. If the mass exceeds 0 0.013 solar masses up to 0 0.8, 0 0.08 solar masses, we will call it a brown dwarf. The temperature of the core for that, such a star, we will call it star, of course, for such star will be enough to for deuterium uh, interaction. Um, this will pr produce some kind of energy. The energy of, uh, of this uh, nuclear fusion, which is we call it deuterium fusion, will uh, result into helium-3 with energy. And here we have neutrino and we have gamma rays. So this will emit in the infrared, this kind of stars will emit in infrared, will not be able to see these stars by our eyes. Uh, it will stay uh, very long. So the, up to now, the, 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 the age of the cosmos is not enough for a star of such kind to uh, finish its lifetime. Uh, it's, so it, it's, it, cons it consumes the uh, nuclear energy very slowly. Uh, the resultant is helium-3 only, nothing else. Now, uh, this deuterium fusion, which result in, result in brown dwarf star, uh, and after trillions of years, it will become uh, a cold uh, object we call uh, uh, black dwarf. Nothing to do with the black holes, completely different, okay? Just black something in the sky, okay? Not a black body. This uh, small star will get cold until it becomes very cold. Not, up to now, in the lifetime of the cosmos, nothing happened like this because it needs long time to happen. This we are talking about between 0 0.013 up to 0 0.08 of the solar masses. Now, the first one who uh, predicted such kind of stars, the brown dwarfs, was Shiv Kumar in 1960. And in 1975, Jill Tartar proposed this name, uh, brown dwarfs, to distinguish them uh, from uh, uh, black dwarfs and white dwarfs and planets. The first one to be observed of this kind of stars was in 1988, during the search for black, uh, white dwarfs in the infrared. So we got this image. It was emitting only infrared, in infrared, nothing in the visible. Later on, several surveys were done by um, uh, two mass uh, telescopes, one in, in, in the United States and the other in Chile. They discovered, discovered many of these uh, brown dwarfs. And later, uh, Hubble Space Telescope 
got several images of these stars. Uh, observationally, we are looking for the lithium. The lithium lines, the lithium lines would be the evidence for this star that it is uh, a brown dwarf. Now we have uh, um, these uh, properties of the, of the brown dwarfs. Before I, I will come back to this, let, look at this image. This image, this image, we are taken by Hubble Space Telescope. In Hubble Space Telescope, we got this image uh, when it's for a brown dwarf. When they covered this um, uh, brown dwarf, we got another one nearby it. So it is a binary of brown dwarf, brown dwarfs, two brown dwarfs. This image were taken by Hubble Space Telescope. It is very clear in, this, uh, in these two images. Let's go back to the uh, uh, properties of these uh, brown dwarfs as of Allard and Humir 2007. The mass is between 0 0.013 up to 0 0.075 solar masses. Some of the, of the researchers wrote here 0 0.08, but those two uh, researchers gave 0 0.075, exactly. And the, the row, the density of the core is between uh, 10 grams per centimeter cubed and less than 1,000 grams per centimeter cubed. The temperature of the core is more than uh, 10,000 degrees, but less than 6 million degrees. It didn't reach 10 million. 10 million means the ability to interact for the hydrogen to interact. So no interaction for hydrogen, no uh, nuclear interaction for uh, anything beyond deuterium. So the temperature uh, of the surface, the effective temperature is more than 650 Kelvin, but less than 3,600 Kelvin, which means it would not be easily to see it in the, in the, in the, in the optical. It will be uh, emitting in the infrared. That's why we call these stars or uh, objects as brown dwarfs. The luminosity is less than 14 to minus two solar uh, luminosities, which, which is very, very small for telescopes to, to observe it. So uh, now we go to the next, next uh, um, mass more than 0 .8, 0 .8, uh, 0.8 solar masses and less than 0.5 solar masses, less than half of the sun. Uh, the temperature of the core in this case will get 10 uh, to the seven kelvins, which means 10 million degrees. 10 million degrees that will uh, be able for the proton-proton chain reaction to start, which means a uh, huge of energy, which means a lot of uh, temperature that will give the star uh, the ability to shine in the in the visible, uh, and the, the peak of the of the of the emission will be in the uh, in the visible, uh, not like that brown dwarf. In this case, we call the 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 yacht of the star. That it starts now uh, to be a main sequence star. It will stay billions of years doing uh, these reactions until it reaches what we call it helium flash. Now, this is the uh, point, uh, zero 0.08 until 0 0.5 solar masses, uh, helium burning, PP chain, proton-proton chains, uh, red dwarf, we call these stars red dwarfs. That one we call it uh, brown dwarfs, but this one, it will emit in the visible, but uh, in the red part of the visible, that's why we call it uh, red dwarfs. Because of that, of that conviction inside the core, it will burn all of the hydrogen, not like the sun. The sun will not burn all of the hydrogen inside it. Uh, this one will burn all of the hydrogen because the temperature is not that high to prevent 
the conviction. So the conviction usually happened in cool stars, not in hot stars. Uh, and this one will result uh, after long time uh, into a, a black uh, dwarf. The next, uh, of course, this black dwarf would be of helium four. That one of the of the brown dwarf was of helium three only. This one would be helium four white dwarf. Uh, now, uh, the the astrophysicist uh, and the nuclear synthesis um, got that for uh, a proton proton we have four chains. These four chains, each of them has a specific temperature to start. Now at our uh, at the core of our sun, three of these uh, interactions uh, are happening there, but the fourth one is not clear yet. This is occurred after uh, Adil Berger in 2011. The first one is the proton-proton chain, which uh, uh, which which is responsible for 83 percent of the energy in the sun. The second one is the proton-proton second chain, which is responsible for around 17% of the energy in the uh, core of the sun. The third one is, uh, is, is responsible for 0.02% of the energy. And the fourth one is still new. They predicted this uh, chain, but not yet uh, actually uh, been observed uh, and approved. These are the four chains of PP. Uh, this is PP1, PP2, PP3, and uh, PP4 has a different image, okay? Now, let's go to the next class of masses. The intermediate uh, uh, mass stars. If the, if the mass between 0.5 solar masses up to 1.5, exactly like our sun, the temperature of the core will exceed 10 to the power seven, 10 millions kelvins. And uh, the, the, the core will uh, exceed also uh, the deuterium and it will, um, uh, uh, it will be having a proton-proton chains, the four chains of proton-proton interactions and it will become a main sequence star. These stars are called dwarfs like our sun, so our sun is dwarf. Um, why we call it a dwarf? Uh, because we we have to, we have uh, big uh, stars comparing with the sun. We have not only big, we have huge, and um, uh, we call giant stars. Comparing with these those stars, our sun is just a dwarf. After billions of years, the the the, he, the hydrogen in the core will uh, be. Uh, exhausted and uh, turned into helium. Uh, then at that time, uh, an, a new um, uh, kind or uh, another uh, uh, shell around the core will start a proton-proton interaction and it will produce helium. By the time the helium ends, the, the hydrogen ends in the shell. So we have the core helium. We are talking about the shell. By the time, that the hydrogen ends in this shell, uh, it will become completely helium. The helium will start to interact, but this will not happen before the contraction of the sun. So the sun will expand and then contract, again expands, contracts, until it reaches the temperature of the, of the uh, helium fusion. By that time, we call it helium flash, Everything above this layer will be exploded in the, in the uh, space and it will result into a brown, uh, white dwarf. This is the, the uh, evolutionary uh, scenario of uh, a star like our sun. Um, yellow dwarf, uh, up to 1.5, helium flash will happen between 0.5 up to 1.5. After that, no helium flash. We'll come to that later. So we have radiative transfer and convective envelope, okay? So we have radiative transfer at the core, uh, which prevents 
getting uh, hydrogen from the upper layer down there. That's why, which is completely different from the uh, red dwarfs. Now, this yellow dwarf will become red giant, and after that, the out layers, the outer layers of the star will be exploded. And um, it's like a formally, uh, uh, this fruit, how you get the, the skin outside and you finally get small uh, fruit, uh, which we call the helium white dwarf. And we have planetary nuclei. Planetary nuclei is just gas um, around this white dwarf. This is the carbon nitrogen oxygen cycle, which is the next after the proton proton chain. So we have deuterium in small stars, after that, proton proton chains, four chains. After that, if the star is bigger, we will get what's, what's called CNO cycle. Now, the, the carbon, the nitrogen, the oxygen will be fused. Uh, this will happen in uh, uh, more massive stars, more than 1.5 and less than eight solar masses. Almost the same, what happened uh, in the uh, 0.5 to 1.5 stars, the same scenario, but at the end of that, the star will not explode by a helium flash. Before that, uh, carbon, oxygen, lithium will be uh, produced uh, in the core and in the uh, shells uh, around the core uh, of the star. And the, the, that's why the, the resultant white dwarf will be composed of carbon, oxygen, and lithium. Uh, this is the difference between these two uh, intermediate stars. So we have now, these are the intermediate stars between five and eight solar masses. We can divide them into three categories. The uh, first one with helium flash, the intermediate one with no helium flash, but all of them, the three categories will result into uh, planetary pula and white dwarfs. The difference is in the composition of the white dwarfs. The first one will give you, like our sun, will give you a helium white dwarf. It's here. The second one will give you carbon white dwarf. The third one will give you oxygen, nitrogen, magnesium white dwarf. This is the difference between the three categories of the intermediate stars. Now, let's go to another interaction, which is the triple alpha after the CNO. If the temperature is getting higher than what CNO needs, we will get a triple alpha uh, reaction. This uh, reaction is responsible for the energy in big stars, massive stars. When it, the temperature reaches 100 million kelvins at the core of the star, this reaction will start. Helium-4 with helium-4 will give you beryllium-8. Again, beryllium-8 will interact with a, a third particle, helium-4, and it will give us a, a, a carbon-12. Uh, this carbon, with uh, ex we call it excited, with, with uh, more energy. Uh, it will annihilate into carbon-12, uh, ordinary carbon-12, without uh, any extra energy and uh, gamma radiations energy. This uh, will happen, as I said, in massive stars, uh, uh, in these kind of stars, which are more massive than eight solar masses. Uh, it will follow the, the same uh, tracks as the intermediate stars, but it will uh, start uh, in uh, fusing all kinds of elements uh, at the core until it reaches the, uh, the ferrum. So the ferrum iron is, is, does not accept to be fused, neither to be if you, uh, no fission, no fu fusion for uh, iron. It's, it's not with those, neither with those, not with the, with the helium and beryllium, also not with the plutonium and uranium. Uranium, plutonium, we call it 
uh, fission uh, for helium and beryllium and hydrogen we call it fusion. So the, the, the iron and the bismuth uh, are sitting there with a very high uh, energy per nucleon. They will not accept to be fused. They will not uh, accept to be also uh, no fission will happen for such stars. Uh, when the core reaches the iron, what will happen? The, the star will contract, no energy. No, there's energy, but not enough for the star to be in, in equilibrium. This is the beginning of the end of such a star. So we, are, we have here eight solar masses, more than eight solar masses, everything the same, except the fate or except the, the remnant. Uh, nuclear fusion until it reaches Ferron. Um, a big star, blue uh, supergiant, uh, it will explode as a supernova. So this supernova, during the explosion, all other elements beyond Ferron will be produced during the explosion, during just seconds. So the, the, if all elements up to Ferron were produced in, in, in a slow process, we call it slow process, and all other elements will be produced in a rapid process during the explosion. The explosion will result into uh, a nebula. Uh, at the center of the nebula, we'll get a neutron star. If the mass of the, of the star, the beginning mass of the star, more than 25 solar masses, the same thing will happen except that uh, the, the resultant core will be a black hole. So the uh, difference between a black hole and a neutron star is, it depends on the, on the mass of the mother star. If the mass is, uh, more than eight solar masses and less than 25 solar masses, we will get a neutron star. If the mass of the star is more than 25 solar masses, after the explosion, the resultant will be a, white, a black hole. During, as I said, uh, the explosion, we will get all elements. That's we, why, why we say we as human beings are ash of stars. Everything in our bodies, all elements in our bodies were formed uh, in such uh, stars and explosions. This is uh, the whole scenario for all kind uh, of stars, uh, from the small stars up to intermediate stars and to massive stars. Um, we can, of course, plot uh, these stages on the uh, HR diagram in what's called the evolutionary tracks. So here we have the evolutionary tracks of the sun. The sun was just a cloud and then it goes down until it reaches, until it reached the main sequence. Uh, it will stay a main sequence stars for nine billion years, 4.5 already passed and another 4.5 billion years for the yacht for the life uh, of, the, of the sun. After that, it will leave the main sequence into a subgiant star. Um, after that, it will reach a red giant. A helium flash will happen somewhere here around, and it will um, repel all of the outer layers of the sun into space, and the resultant will be a white dwarf. Of course, the, we know that there's a limit for the mass of the white dwarf, which is around around 1.4 solar masses as predicted by Chandra Sikhar. Um, uh, but I, I'd like to mention something here that the, the 1.4, uh, Chandra Sikhar, by the way, uh, the first prediction uh, for Chandra Sikhar wa was less than uh, 1.4. And later on, it was about around 0.9. Later on, he, uh, recalculated and uh, he used the relativistic quantum mechanics uh, to uh, deduce or to expect the mass of the white dwarf. But the mass of the white dwarf depends on the composition, on its composition. So the limit of the mass of a white dwarf, helium white dwarfs, different than, different than 
the, 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 the limit of a white dwarf, which is composed of uh, nitrogen and oxygen. You should be aware when we talk about the limit. It's not 1.4 or not 1.44. It depends. You have to tell me what's the composition of the white dwarf. I'll tell you what's the limit. So here we have uh, the evolutionary tracks of several uh, kinds of stars, different masses. I mean, a small mass star, it will become a regent. Those uh, 0.1 up to 0.5, uh, nothing will happen. It, no, they will not leave the main sequence up there. So they will stay as they are. I mean, the brown dwarfs and the red dwarfs. Nothing will happen in explosion. So up the explosion will happen to stars more massive than uh, 0.5 solar masses. And here we have the uh, different stage of these stars. Uh, a simplistic giant branch, we have the uh, blue supergiants, we have uh, yellow supergiants, red supergiants, and uh, all these uh, things. Uh, I hope that I um, could just give an idea about the evolution of stars. Um, I have several and more things written about the, uh, what's going on and about the uh, interactions and about the energy which result from each interaction. If you want this information, just please contact me and I'll send you uh, this chapter, which was written in my book. Thank you very much. Any question, I'm ready. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mashour, for this presentation. So please, if you have any questions, so you can unmute yourself or you would like to uh, raise your hand and ask us questions through chat. So it depends up to you. So please, any questions? In Arabic or in English? Uh, go ahead. Yes. Dr. Mashhur, Assalamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Assalam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. I would like to ask about uh, when we have uh, binary systems or triple systems. No. Uh, so do the same scenario uh, work in such cases or some changes would take place? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Barwan. Actually, uh, when we, uh, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, stellar, uh, uh, systems when we talk about a binary or a triple or quadruple, let's talk about a binary and uh, Dr. Antonius knows uh, a lot about these things. The scenario is a bit different. Why? Because some of, if you have a contact binary, the scenario will completely differ. But if you have a detached binary, detached means that each star is far enough from the other star to live its own life. They will have the same scenario as I talked here about. But if they are contact binary, that means one of the of the uh, stars will be a donor. It will give matter to it will give matter to, to the second star. The secondary uh, star will uh, uh, be turned into another kind of stars. It will uh, give X-ray sometimes gamma ray. It depends. So mainly X-ray uh, due to the accretion we call the accretion disks. And in some cases, if the this star is a neutron star, or just a dwarf dwarf, and you give it matter, a material that it exceeds the mass of this compact object beyond 1.4 solar masses, it will be uh, turned into a neutron star through some kind of explosion. So the scenario is completely different for contact binaries. It is the same for detached binaries. For semi-detached, it's in between. I hope that I answered your question. Please, any other question? One more question, if nobody would like to ask. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. OK. Uh, in the last. Uh, conference of the WSW 
which was uh, actually conducted by uh, Awas and uh, all partners, including us also. Uh, I think Professor uh, Shouk Dalal mentioned one interesting uh, fact, as he said, which is regarding the collision of neutron stars. If you remember, I don't know if you were there or not. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you are an astrophysicist anyway, so I didn't get the chance, have the chance that time to ask him. So what he said is, uh, most of the gold, the gold that we know uh, in the universe, especially of the Earth, uh, are not product of the supernova, supernovae themselves as we used to know, but because of the collision between two massive Newton stars. And one collision is enough to make, and this is good news for those who want to make uh, money, can, can make about one or two Earth mass of gold yes. uh, in one collision. So can you just tell us something about this interesting? Yeah, yeah it's, it's the same. It's the same scenario. Yeah, which we uh, which you asked about. That in this case we are talking about a binary system. If you have a binary uh, uh, close binary, we call it contact binary. In this case, uh, and they collide together during the collision, um, different scenarios of nuclear reactions would happen because that the huge amount of energy due to the collision. In this case, of course, as uh, Professor Shoki said, you will get uh, specific elements sometimes, and in other cases, you'll get the wide range of elements, but it will be focused on some elements like the gold. Uh, uh, they call it the gold. In this case, of course, you will not be able to get gold from these stars, but uh, because in other stars like carbon, carbon in, this, in, these, in these white dwarfs would be almond. Almas, we call the Almas, like this brown dwarf we talk about. So in this case, we get the almond, which is more expensive than gold. Don't worry. So you can uh, wait for our sun to become a white dwarf, and hopefully you'll get some. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Radul Almas. Okay, another question for. Uh, Students, you have questions? If I were uh, attending such a lecture, I would ask hundreds of questions. Uh, so we have to wait uh, for a billion years to get the diamond, Dr. Uh, sure. 4.5 4, 4. billion years, you will not be able to be there. Oh, I thought 4 billion, so I said it's close, <laughs> but now it is far, so most no, of all, we will not get that. <laughs> thank you very much, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mosho, for this uh, presentation, and hopefully everyone benefited. And uh, thank you for the attendees for attending. So as uh, Professor Mosho was saying at the beginning, this is a very good uh, opportunity for all of us to learn more and more about what we are doing. And hopefully all the students and all the participants have benefited from it. Uh, so thank, thank you. you and see you, uh, see you in about two weeks' time. Thank you, thank very, you very much. much. Thank you.